Good morning. God bless everybody. Hey, Pastor Bubby, how are you? Are you on with me? Pastor Bubby. You must have muted yourself. Can you all hear me? Because I know I did not hit the wrong button. <laughs> oh, there's Magpie. She's saying, God bless everybody. So if someone can in chat, let me know if you can hear me okay. Oh, Pastor Bubby says it's five by five. But he's not going to talk this morning, evidently. All right, Melissa can hear and Katie. Well, God bless you all. And thank you for joining me this morning. Wow, it's a beautiful morning here today. And um, we sure need to be praying for all those that are in the line of this uh, hurricane, this storm. And I know that you guys have been praying and um, we need to just anymore. It just seems like each day we're brought with more and more things on our plate that we can pray for. But we have a lot of brothers and sisters through COT and also those that are maybe in our families and friends, loved ones that um, are in the path of this storm. I thought it was kind of ironic they named the storm Matthew because I've been studying a lot about the disciples particularly. And then, you know, we're in the word a lot and we study quite a bit in Matthew in Matthew chapter four is very relevant for today. So anyway, we'll just, we'll keep praying and um, storms went through the midsection of the country. It was kind of funny. Most of the storms were about 30 miles east of me. So they, they didn't cut through where I live, but I know they did. There were tornadoes, tornado watches, there were things going on. And then we've been praying for those in California because it seems like there's some weirdness out there with, um, I've never seen this before, but on RSOE, they had closed down city hall in San Bernardino. And then they just keep talking about this earthquake that's coming. And so we also are praying for people all across our nation. I was listening to a minister the other day and he was saying how disconnected we are as a country and that we seem to somehow kind of put out of our mind if we live on the east coast if something's going on on the west coast we don't really give a lot of um, credence to it it's almost like we're disconnected and so this is just a good reminder for us to keep everyone in prayers and of course all those in the military right now and um, their families I can especially relate to their families and um, just keeping the military in prayer and thanking the Lord for sending his commanding angels to be their front and rear guards and that they would have wisdom and to carry out the commands that they are given in protection under the shadow of the wings of the almighty father. And so that's something to pray for. We also have several in our COC family that are um, struggling with different uh, sicknesses in the flesh. And so we just continue to claim healing for the glory of the Lord, that um, as he heals them, that his name would be glorified in the healing. And knowing that he has us on our path and our walk with him, and sometimes there's a sickness that is not unto death, but it is for the glory of his name. And so when people go to the doctor, there are testimony for him. You know, we just don't know all the ins and outs of what he's doing, but we're thankful to be a partaker in what he's doing. And so we said, yes, Lord, we said we shall go. And so we go forth, we go forth with him. And so that's some prayers. If you guys are feeling the, the desire, if you want to pray, that would be something you could pray for. There's also some that um, I've been ministering to as of late. 
and they're really having some struggles in their homes, in their actual dwelling in their homes. And um, it kind of is what prompted me what I'm going to teach about today. And so um, we need to keep praying for our brothers and sisters in the Lord because some are in abusive situations. Some are trying to hold everything together in their households. And we know that the Lord is their strength. We know that as we wait upon him, our strength arises. And so it's just a good time for us to come along beside one another and hold one another up in prayer. Be be edifying, be encouraging. And um, one of the things that has really been on my heart that I've been seeing is, um, and Tatum tomorrow, Tatum's going to do a broadcast tomorrow. And I believe, I don't have the details. All I know is the title, but I believe that the Lord has probably laid it on her heart to take what I'm getting ready to say many steps further. But so many are being um, taken captive in their minds and by the enemy. We're to have the mind of Christ. We're to have a renewed mind. We are to shut all doors to the enemy. And we sh- really, at this point, we shouldn't be a play toy, a play thing for the enemy. We should be, as soon as the door, a crack is revealed by the Holy Spirit, we should be shutting those doors. And um, so Tatum, I think, is going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow. And hopefully I'm not being presumptuous there, but I'm assuming that's what she's talking about. And then Pastor Bubby, I want to just thank him, of course, for producing the broadcast this morning. But Pastor Bubby is an excellent resource, and he is so willing and giving in of his time and of his heart. He says it's his honor. <laughs> he's so cute. Anyway, um, and, and he really, does, he's not just saying that, like he walks that out. It is an honor for him. I know that. But, um, you know, don't be fearful to call Pastor Bubby. Do not be fearful at all. The beauty about him is that he serves with humility because he was delivered of much. And when you've been delivered of much, then you're so very grateful. You're, you have a greater measurement of gratefulness to the Father and humbleness. And so you, there's no condemnation. You want to just help as many as you can. So if you find yourself in a state of constant complaining, like you're complaining about this and complaining about that, you know, step out of that. Get out of that comfort zone of complaint. Call Pastor Bubby and get delivered. Amen? Amen. I mean, there's no reason to just stay in that. And sometimes complaint, I don't even know why I'm talking about this. It's not even written down. But sometimes complaint, I even know for me it's happened, complaint can become our comfort zone rather than be delivered. It just seems easy to be easier to just be complaining, complaining. And so is Pastor Bubby and Jesus are one phone call away, Julie. And you'll be so happy after you make the call. And Pastor Bubby, he always glorifies the Lord. Like, it's not him doing it. He's not delivering anyone. It's the Holy Spirit that operates through him. Although the Holy Spirit will give him clarity. And when you minister to people, you often get divine clarity. You get revelations so that you can edify and encourage someone. So anyway, those are just some of the things that are laid in my heart. And then collectively as a body here at Council of Time, we've been praying for those that we love that are either unsaved or lukewarm. The lukewarm has really been on my heart lately. And so we have many that are churching it. I call it they're playing church, but they're not walking out their faith. And so that's been on my heart. But we have many that we are praying collectively for our loved ones, that they come into the full understanding and knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus. And so... But I just wanted to share some prayer points because you guys are mighty prayer warriors and, and I thank you for it. And um, 
So before we get started, I just ask that the Holy Spirit would take over the broadcast today, that this um, broadcast would encourage and edify, that it would teach us more of the precepts of Jesus, that we're learning to walk in the ways of Jesus. We're actually starting to spread our wings and fly, no longer bound down in sin, which is something, Lord, that we're very grateful for because I didn't even know a year ago that it was possible. But I thank you, Father, that you're teaching us. And um, so just anoint my lips to speak, that my flesh would silence and that your name would be glorified. Thank you, Lord. Open the eyes and the ears to receive spiritually, letting go of all preconceived notions of who you are and what you're about. Teach me too, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So with that, we'll get started. I want to say hi to everybody. I see Melissa and Paula and Hades is in there and um, Pastor Bubby and Magpie and Kenneth, I'm backing up now. So God bless you all. And I didn't mean to miss anyone. I know some of you all are just waking up and you're just listening, but thank you for joining us. And my prayer is that you will be blessed. And I know you will be. Oh, there's Okie Dokie. <laughs> he says, I don't, I see you now. <laughs> you know you better than to try to hide from me, mister. <laughs> Anyway, so I know you'll be blessed because we're going to be in the scripture. And so anytime we're in the word, we're blessed. Amen. And so we're going to be in Second Corinthians chapter six, but not quite yet. Um, the first thing I wanted to just remind us all, because we have many that are watchmen on the wall and um, you kind of hang back a little bit. But you're watching all the time and you're in, I know you're praying constantly. And so we've been lately been washing our robes and making them white. And we, the word says we wash the robe. So how do we wash our robe? We wash our robe with repentance. And as we repent, then we're washing and our robes are made white. But there are um, many facets to this, but I just pulled out. Four, I want to go over four stages of our calling after we're saved. And we get saved. Jesus knocks on the door of our hearts and we ask him to come in. And that is a beautiful process. And it actually starts the process. And so a lot of people, they're not really aware of the fact that when that door opens and it, he comes in as a flood, and so we don't often tell people that that's when the purging begins. And so I just wanted to quickly go over how um, these stages actually build one upon another. So it's not like you accomplish one thing, turn away from it, and then you've moved up to a different level. These are like building blocks. This, I would look at it more as like a, a building block of the foundation of our faith. And so the first one is um, sanctification. And in this process, we learn to listen to God. We learn what it looks like to be obedient. And that's where we begin to die to self. And throughout the whole process, we're dying to self. I mean, daily, daily, we die to self. We, you know, I died to self this morning. And even right now, as the Lord teaches us in the scripture, we're dying to self. The second one is to worship the Lord. The Holy Spirit begins to teach us what it is like to worship in spirit and in truth. And so worship actually is the greatest sacrifice of self because it's in that worship time that you become one with the Father. And the enemy has no choice. He must flee when you're in worship. So sometimes when, when we're in our greatest trials, if we just go into a place of worship, we may not even feel like it, but it's an exchange. It's a spiritual exchange. And um, our spirit exchanges with the Father. And it, it's amazing the strength that actually you receive when you go into that worship. The next one then is serving others. So in this process of dying to self, others become more important 
because we become less important. <laughs> and so we can put away those childish ways and um, we then begin to lay our lives down in servanthood for another person. And um, after that, then we become where we are walking in authority. We start to see our, ourselves through the eyes of Jesus and we become more like royalty. We, we have dominion. We become watchmen. We understand that we can actually rule over earth. It takes a ridding of flesh to understand that we can rule and reign with, with Jesus. And um, so we become that new creature in Christ. And we start to be complete in him and receive his fullness. And it's really amazing this process how it works and like i said it's building like you don't you don't start to walk in the authority and quit being sanctified <laughs> it, it's it's yes and yes and so the soul our soul most must obey the spirit when we put all things under subjection to jesus and this goes back to why I really felt led to encourage you all, if you need, to call Pastor Bubby, because he helps walk you through that process. Because your your soul, my soul, it truly must come under that subjection to Jesus. It, it doesn't have a choice unless I give it a choice. And so that was just a little nugget there. That wasn't even what I was led to teach on today, but I felt like it was important for us to know who we are in Christ. Amen. Who we are. I'm going to take a drink. So I hope you guys have your coffee and I hope you have your Bible. And let me tell you, <laughs> if you ever want to walk through some fire <laughs> and fire for purification, it's a good thing. This is not a complaint. But just start studying about a covenant. <laughs> oh, my Lord, have mercy. You know, the other day when I thought, covenant, what is this covenant? And I am telling you, I, I haven't been put to, through so much testing and fiery trials in a long time. And I kept pushing through. And I would even tell people, well, what would you pray for me? I'm going through some fire. And it was like the it just kept coming and kept coming even up until I went on air and it's just distractions. Like it's not, it's time consuming. That's all it was like yesterday, all day long. It was just time consuming, time consuming. And I'm sure you all can relate to this. So it must be really important. And I just want to briefly go over what a covenant is. And simply put, a, co a covenant is a promise, but it's not, it is not a casual promise. Rather, it, it would resemble something like I commit myself fully and you're committing yourself fully to completion. You never stop doing whatever it takes to make this work. And I know a lot of people think immediately of a covenant of, marriage because marriage is a good example of a covenant but we have many covenants in our lives and so for for the purpose of today think of the covenant as your castle michael's been talking about the castle or your inner circle or those that you are like-minded with in the body and um Oki just put in the original covenant and the renewed covenant they as Elohim are one. Yes, it's that in unity, that oneness. So keep in mind that a covenant is not necessarily mutual. Rather, it is you giving of yourself to another. It's a one-way promise without conditions. And it's for the benefit of the other. It's not for our own. So like we were talking about putting away our selfish, childish way, this would be a covenant but not to benefit self. So our father is the original and eternal example, right? Of what defines the covenant. Because he came in the flesh as his son Jesus in the covenant grace in order 
to unite himself with his chosen people. And so God loves all. However, his covenant is with his own. And that's really important to grasp, okay? That's the foundation of today's teaching. Understand that he loves all, but there's a particular people that are his own that he's in covenant with. So examples are found, and you guys are probably familiar with this, but, you know, David, Noah, Moses, Abraham, and especially Israel. And, and we know, we understand about Israel and the covenant. So his his very nature, therefore, testifies of his faithfulness to fulfill his covenant regardless of man's fault or weaknesses to to adhere to our own faithfulness in our own nature goes against his very nature because he is faithfulness. That's what he is. And so there's just one true new covenant through the seed of David that came forth through the seed of David, right? And that's Jesus. And that's in which all men receive the get, the gift of reconciliation to the Father. That can only be received through Jesus. So this covenant is not written on tablets of stone, which is spoken of a lot in the Old Testament, but rather placed upon and indwelling within our hearts. That's the circumcision of the heart. And who can do this? Only God can do this. There's not another person on this earth that can circumcise our hearts or write upon our hearts or or um, take over our hearts, indwell fully in our heart. That is something that can only be accomplished through Jesus. And that's awesome. It's not awesome, you guys, because that's the way it should be. Because deceitfully, I suppose I could place someone fully in my heart, but I won't be satisfied. This is just coming to me right now. I won't be satisfied because there's only one that can occupy, occupy every chamber of our heart, and that's Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So anyway, the new covenant comes through the forgiveness of and cleansing of sin, which is attainable only one way. And we know what that is. That's true, heartful, remorseful repentance. So Jesus is the only way. So we are to unite with fellow believers and partake of the covenant together in order to be an expression of him to the world. Right? Amen. God bless you, Jojo. (laughs) Jojo just joined us. So as we do this, we advance his love and glory of the gospel into the hearts and minds of others who desperately need him. And often they deny him, right? But the denial doesn't change the covenant that we have with the Lord. Does that make sense? Like, just because someone may deny us or deny him because he's in us, our covenant with him doesn't change. Isn't that just amazing? Thank you, Father. And so we have to think about maybe... We have many relationships, right? We have a lot of people that come and go in our lives. We have some that are family that have known us since birth. But what I want to talk about today is to be careful who you make covenant with, who you let into your castle, who you intimately get entwined with, Because some of us have fallen into a snare and really been used as a plaything for the enemy because we have placed others in a covenant position that was not orchestrated by the Father. So this is a message of love. 
And like Sissy Mary said, we ought to not give up on those that deny him. They can still get right with the Lord later down the road. We keep praying for them. Amen. And Sissy Mary says it right. Keeping the inner courts guarded. Amen. And I'm going to show you in scripture that Jesus did that very thing. And we would be wise to heed to the ways of him and what he did. So we're going to see this in the scripture. And so this is a message of love. I want to say that first and proclaim that first. This isn't about loving. We love all. This isn't denying the fact of love. Love remains. Love is. Love was and is and is to come. It isn't something that you turn on and off like a running faucet. You don't decide today, today I don't feel like loving, so I'm not going to turn that faucet on. It is. It just is. It's poured into you. You pour it out to others. This is about covenant. This is about intimacy. This is about who you entangle yourself with. So, as children of the light, we should love those in darkness, yet not feast, take part in what they're doing. That's the inner circle. And in the Old Testament, or excuse me, New Testament, and I, oh, I want to give a shout out to Vera, because Vera, I don't talk to Vera outside of chat. And I saw this morning, she posted the very scripture I was teaching on in chat this morning. And I thought, wow, because as soon as I pulled Chatwing up, she had the scripture in there that I was going to teach on in Second Corinthians chapter 6. But anyway, this is all about that intimacy. And so in Second Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about here being equally yoked. And um, verses 1 through 13, I'm just going to read it real quick since we have time. And if you all have your Bibles open, you can follow along. And um, it says, We then, as workers together with him, so here, here's that being unified, that equally yoked, being unity as workers. He says, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So it's not about us. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I support thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Amen? Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Okay, you're going to see in a minute why this is so important. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in affliction, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. And then he goes on to say, oh ye, oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. So see, they had a heart for those they were ministering to, just like we do. Yet are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same. I speak as unto my children, as be ye also enlarged. And I'm going to stop right there for now. Thank you, okie dokie, for placing that scripture in chat. And so what he's telling us here is we're workers together. And today is the day of salvation. And if it isn't, then grace is for our vain desire. If we get offended, the ministry can be blamed. So we're all ministers of God, all of us, 
each one of you that are listening to me today, you are a minister of the Lord. And because of that, at times we may suffer patience because of patient faith. We may have affliction and distress. We may get beaten up, be imprisoned. We may suffer through tumults. We may actually labor. We're constantly watching. We're fasting. But when all of this happens, we're not to have any offense. Because if we become offended, we often will react in vain. We get emotional. We start to respond emotionally. And we'll kind of run to and fro. We may go from set to the it said the left hand and the right. We may go from to one person on our right. And we're trying to figure something out. And then we go to the left. We're trying to figure another thing out. And so we start to really get compromised in a fence. But what happens, say 10 of us or 12, we'll use 12 because of 12 disciples. Say 12 of us are gathered together as ministers. If just one person out of the 12 becomes offended and they start reacting because of their vanity, their, their childish ways, then the whole ministry suffers. The whole ministry becomes null and void. And that was what we just read here in verse 3. But they're telling us here in 2 Corinthians to give no offense so the ministry be not blamed. So they they may have had different ideas, thoughts, perceptions on what Jesus told them to do. But they, as the disciples, did, were not overtaken with offense. So in places of offense... We are to respond, and this is verses 6 through 10, by pureness, godly knowledge, long-suffering, kindness, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, by unfeigned love, to have the word of truth, which gives us the power of God, and therefore we have on the armor of righteousness, not our righteousness, but her, it, or his, her is his I got to read about Oki, but last time I took offense, it turned out to be barbed wire, and boy, did I get entangled and back up. <laughs> He's so funny. Amen. Me too. That just happened to me, Oki. I'm going to share what happened to me the other day. You're going to laugh. Anyway, we're, we're to, to bring, it says being honored or dishonored. So in this scripture, whether someone's honoring us for being a minister or dishonoring us for a minister, it really doesn't matter. When someone speaks evil or good about us, if we're in that covenant with the Lord and not in the covenant with those we shouldn't be, then it really doesn't matter. And whether they are deceiving or true, when we are known or unknown, through dying we live, we're disciplined, but we're not killed. Like he's not destroying us, we're just being disciplined. And it's in that sorrow that we actually rejoice. And we may be poor, yet we do all we can to make others rich. I love that. Don't we at times feel poor in the spirit? I'm not talking financial here. This is all spiritual. Do you ever feel poor in the spirit? Like you just are really looking to maybe seek someone to come in and encourage you and edify you. And you may make a phone call to someone that is you're equally yoked with. Like you just are looking to be, you know, someone to pray with you over the phone. I did this with Oki not too long ago. Called him on the phone. Anyway, so... At that point in time, you're wanting, you're feeling poor in the spirit. You reach out to someone, and what ends up happening, you end up making them rich. I just, I love that scripture. I thought, amen, that's so incredible. And that's how we bless one another. So this says we have nothing in the natural. Nothing. Well, in the spiritual, we have attained it all. 
So yeah, it's all spiritual, right? We have nothing in the natural, but in the spiritual, we have attained all things. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. So in verse 7, it says, Doing this as ministers of the gospel, our hearts enlarged. Don't we want an enlarged heart? If you compare our, our small hearts compared to the heart of Jesus, look, I mean, his heart was big enough to take on all the sins of the world. That's how much he loved, loved everybody. But when we do these things, when we keep covenant with him first, with the Father first, our hearts are enlarged. And then we can actually love people the way he intended us to love them. And what happens when a heart is enlarged, we can see that in verse 13. It says, in doing so, we instruct others as much as we would our own children. So we instruct them in love. That's, I, I'm like, a light bulb went on for me. So if we have people as ministers that we're sent to to minister to, our heart becomes enlarged, and we love them as much as we would love our own children, and so we can instruct in love. Does that make sense, y'all? Because it, it really, I mean, it gave me a lot of clarity, and I hope it is you too. <laughs> Yes, I love that, what JoJo said. JoJo in chat, she said, tender loving with no blame. Amen. So the instructions that were given here is um, to be not unequally yoked together. That's verse 14 in Second Corinthians. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? So this gives us, the reason the scripture is in there is so that we can take heed and get a clear picture here of what it looks like to partake with others. And so... We don't want to be in a covenant with unholiness where the exchange is unholy. But we want to stay in that perfect covenant of love with the Father so that we are able to instruct in love so our heart is enlarged. Right? Amen? And we're going to study this a little bit more, but... Since Oki brought up the barbed wire, I'm going to tell you what happened to me over the, well, it's been ongoing around here and it is what it is and that's fine. But at times we get entangled in a covenant that is quite possibly not orchestrated by the Lord. And when that happens, it's breeding ground for offense. So, and you all, this isn't, the details of it is not what is important, but I'm going to share it because I believe all of us are placed in different situations, similar day in and day out. And mine just happened to be around here, this happened, but you guys have faced this daily as well. So I was blamed for something that I had no part in. <laughs> How many, did, I mean, does that happen to you all sometimes? I, well, I know it. Even my kids at times will say, they can't find something. Well, what'd you do with it? It's your fault, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, this particular time, I had let someone in to the castle, to the inner court myself. And so that's the setup. And it's okay because all this was birthed out of it. So this person is still and was very dear to me. And the thing about it is, you know, this person I had actually poured love into for several years, you know, been very connected with them and have been um, 
just ministering and being being very um, giving. And um, at times it was a giving and receiving. But in a moment of offense, that person, I mean, they wrote me out of their life in a blink. Just in a blink. And um, at first, I was quite stunned. You know, you see those commercials, or not commercials, but cartoons, you know, you may they may have swat a fly and it's just kind of stunned before it kills over and dies. That would have been me. <laughs> I was just really stunned. And I thought after all this time, laying my life down and um, just to be so easily written off. Do you guys hear the pride? You see the pride that, that, that is stun- being stunned brings pride, right? And I just stood amazed at the fence. And it just started, the offense just started to take hold of me in like a matter of, now we're talking seconds here, okay? And so initially after the shock wore off, then I started barking orders. Isn't this funny? In offense, for a moment, I became defensive. And this is important. I became defensive. And what happens when you become defensive? I wanted to tell my side of the story. You always do that. Like first, you know, I was stunned and then I got offended. And then because it hurt my flesh, because I was in pride, hurt my flesh. And then next step is I got defensive. So I wanted to tell my side of the story. And so who doesn't want to tell their side of the story and proclaim innocence when you've been falsely accused. I mean, isn't that what the flesh wants to do? Yeah, you know. And so what really, looking back, hurt my pride is that obviously this person didn't value me the way I valued them because they didn't even care about truth or they would have even just come to me and asked me if I had done something than what they thought I had done. But rather they, listening to the lies of the enemy, assumed I I was the one that had done something. And so they cut me right out of their life. Boom. So it was very humbling because, number one, I obviously am not near as important as I thought I was. And number two, it just, you know, some people, they just can write people off. Like they just, it doesn't bother them. So can you all at some point in time, can you think of when something similar has happened to you as in like yesterday? (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. But I'm sure that this is ongoing. So I had to take a breath when that happened. I, I just, had a, and amen, Jojo. Jojo said to take to um, pray for them. Yes, it, it, that's the thing, Jojo. Been praying, had been done, done so is. the The prayer thing was taken care of. So what I had to do when this happened is um, I had a choice to make. I could stay in a fence or put my flesh under subjection to Christ. And we talked about that a minute ago. So after I, you know, just got over myself, I put my flesh under the subjection and I no longer was in a spirit of defense. I decided to silence my tongue and I took one for the team. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians 6 where it says giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Okay. Do you see how this is a coming full circle? So I took one for the team, right? So the whole ministry would not suffer because I could have created a storm in it. Just wanting to be for myself. Well, I, if I wanted to save a name for myself, because really my hand was not even in it. So what the Lord started showing me is this beautiful um, parable of what this looks like. Have you guys all heard the best defense is a good offense? 
you've heard that saying before, right? You know, a lot of teens that play sports, they, they are, it's all about being offensive. Nobody wants to get in a reactive mode. Once we start reacting, then we get into a whirlwind of reaction and we're no longer proactive. Well, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, he's all about proactiveness, not being reactive. And so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is all about us being reconciled to Christ. And so we need to do all we can to stay to stay spiritually in Christ's mindedness so that we are proactive. Yeah, and like Oki said, he doesn't like to be in an active <laughs> he doesn't like to be in it. Wow, he is so funny. I'm going to get him. But we we shouldn't be constantly in a reactive state. We need to be keep our covenant with the Father perfected so that we're not reacting. So the best defense is a good offense. And so the Lord started showing me what would a, a holy offense look like? It would be love. Right? Not offense, being offended, but actually walking in a good offense. And that's love, holy love. So defense, defensiveness destroys, it tears down relationships, it breaks everything. But holy offense, love, it builds up. Right? And isn't that what the Lord is doing? He's building up the body of Christ. And he's doing that in love. He's breaking us down in everything that destroys and rebuilding it back up with love. Amen. Oh, I pray you all are getting this. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would help us to not cling to the, the whispers of the enemy any longer which actually opens doors to let him in to destroy us through offense. Lord, forgive us for times that we've let this happen, which have left others in the wake of our own destruction. Deliver us, Lord, from corrupting ourselves by not actually walking in love towards all brethren. Help us, Lord, to get this. Help us, Lord, to walk this out and to see the fullness of the truth of it. Not just what we preconceive is truth. Help us to get this source. So once we get that this is truly 100% fully a message of love, that we are to spread those seeds of love, that we have received seeds of love from the Father, then our hearts are enlarged. We, we are more mature. And at some point in time, we need to let our yes mean yes and our no mean no. That those that are called for us to minister to, that we can't have the tail wagging the dog here. And I think many times that was what's happened. And it will bring down the whole ministry when the tail starts wagging the dog. Okay, so we read a portion of Second Corinthians 6, verse 14, about being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And this just to clarify, now we have the offense behind us. We're going to clarify what it looks like to be unequally yoked together. And it means to fellowship with one who is not spiritually like-minded. To try to, and this is me talking now and I'll get back into um, the actual breakdown in Greek. You can't be in covenant with someone that does not have the mind of Christ if you have the mind of Christ. You're to teach them 
what it looks like to have the mind of Christ. But you don't bring them into covenant with you. Okay, back to the Greek. The apostle here was, in this particular scripture, was telling the Corinthians to never engage in sexual activity with anyone who is an idolater. Do not engage intimately, spiritually with anyone in bondage. Do not serve with them. That's what it means in Greek. Now, for those of you who like to twist what I'm saying and get mad in offense, I'm not talking about don't love them. I don't know how many times I have to say this. This is not about love. This is about intimacy. And we're going to see why. Because righteousness has no fellowship with unrighteousness. Fellowship is a sharing, a participating with, a companion of. It means to cling to someone. It's to give actual regard to, to consider what they're saying, to be joined intimately with. The scripture says light has no communion with darkness. Communion here in Greek. It means demonstration of fellowship, to share intimacies with, to associate with, to exchange giftings, to join in partnership with, to partake with demons inside a vessel who another who, who authors heathen worship. It means to join with something unholy, with something unclean. A believer has no commonality with an infidel outside of love. He said, come out of her, my people. So as the temple of God, we do not come into agreement and align and engage in idolatry, right? Because God said he will dwell in us. He will walk in us. He are he is our God. We are his people. Isn't that that the foundation of covenant? And just a side note, the blind the blind can't lead the blind. The slave cannot set free the slaves. The lame cannot help the lame walk. This is why He appoints ministers and disciples. Because as a minister, you should no longer be enslaved. You should no longer be lame. So that you can go to those that are lame and are slaves. And you can help them. Right? And so we are in covenant with those that are fellow ministers, but we teach and exhort and we minister to those who need ministered to. So he says, therefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, touch not the unclean thing, as I will receive you and will be a father unto you. You will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Glory, hallelujah. Amen? He wants us to come out and be separate. So, the rest of the story is actually in the next chapter. In I think I, I told you all, you know, that how the Bible was written in, in scroll format. So, there, there wasn't a chapter. So, I really felt like when we finished chapter six, we were kind of left hanging because that was just a beautiful, beautiful ending to that whole chapter because we want him to receive us. And he says he will be a father and will be his sons and daughters. But let's just read verse one of the next chapter because that seals the deal. He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, 
with and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. Is that beautiful? So he's promised us as we cleanse ourselves, washing our robes. How do we wash our robes? Repentance, heartfelt repentance. From all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear, which is the reverence of God. Amen? So in doing this, um, we need to like, we need to let go of all judgment. We really need to have the mind of Christ so that we stop calling evil good and good evil because that's really going on. And that is really on my heart lately. We, ha we have got to stop these childish ways because a woe is coming. And there's a scripture that says, oh, well, I don't have any of this written down. I feel compelled to speak it. The scripture says there's a woe coming to those who call evil good and good evil. So why are we doing this? Help us, Lord. Lord, have mercy. It's like I can almost feel the ramifications of this woe that's coming. And it's coming to the church. That's the other thing. He's going to purge the church because he has covenant with his people. And his covenant is going to be established on, on earth as it is in heaven through his people. He loves all. But many are called and few are chosen. Right? And Layla shared a story with me. She was listening to Zach Panoon. I don't know if any of you all have listened to him before. But he told an amazing story, and I see it all the time. And it goes along with what I shared, my testimony of what happened. And I'll make it real quick, but she was telling me about how he was sharing something that actually happened in his church body. And I've seen it over and over. But um, the youth were gathering together in the woods, and there were some church people there, and um, they were just having a celebration. Well, there were some um, people from a distance knew that there was a gathering going on, and during that gathering, um, there was smoke all around. And um, there were people that called themselves, themselves Christians, but they were not at the gathering. And so um, they started to get really offended. And they went to the minister and they said, look, look what happened. They, you know, I thought the church, the church, these people, they were gathered together. And you know what they were doing over there? They were smoking. Smoking. Boy, that really, well, I'm not even going to go there. Anyway, they were smoking. Your church people over there, they were smoking. Well, here we go. We got the accuser of the brethren. The brethren accusing the brethren. It's pitiful. Lord, have mercy. You don't have the, the unsaved out there accusing us as much as you have the brethren accusing the brethren. Assumptions. Do you know what happens when you assume? <laughs> you guys do know because I can't say it on air. But anyway, so long story short, after the minister did some investigation, it was, they weren't smoking. But who cares if they were? Why do we tell on people that sin differently than we sin? Because that's going on all the time. But anyway, back to the story. They were, there were bugs, and they had um, those snuffer things that spray for bugs or whatever, they, those puffer things. They were using those to keep the bugs away while they were gathering together and worshiping the Lord. 
But the ones outside of the gathering, all they saw was the smoke and ran and told on, falsely accused, no mind you, those that were at the gathering. I see this all the time. Do you all see it? You know, I always say, yep, you know, you can tell when the accuser of the brethren is present because they will go for those that um, drink alcohol, that smoke cigarettes, are divorced, and are Catholic. Every time. They pride themselves on the fact that they don't smoke. They pride themselves on the fact they don't drink. They pride themselves on the fact they've never been divorced. Or if they have, it was not, they had no hand in it. And they pride themselves on the fact that they either are not Catholic, nor have, have they ever fallen for that delusion. And I'm here to say that they're delusional if they're being an accuser of the brethren from the get-go. They're in a delusion. And I was telling Lele, I said, it's so funny because I'm like, if, if someone did a teaching on what was sinful, do you think that they would include any of the sins that they're in right now themselves? Or would they only talk about the ones that they've overcome through Christ? And really, if we're not in a sin, like, um, for example, let's take drugs, for example. You know, I am so thankful that that is not a temptation that the Lord has placed in my life for the edification of the saints. Many people that have suffered through some sort of sin only to be delivered at the hand of the G of the Father through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is so they can go into the world and minister to those that are suffering from that sin. But that was not me. And I'm very grateful for that, although I have my own. And most of you all know them, because I'm in pretty much an open book. I figure if you have nothing to hide, why hide it? But it's to go out and be a blessing to others. So if you haven't suffered through a divorce, we shouldn't hang our hats on that. We should look for our lives in our lives what we've been delivered from so that we can help those that are suffering from such. And I feel so bad again for our Catholic brothers and sisters that have come into COT and have been run away. And it's because we're offended that we run them away. I mean, when you take it to the Lord, if you feel so very strongly that there's not one saved soul in the Catholic church, then you better stop everything you're doing and go to the Lord and ask him because either I'm completely like off in right field alone or you are because I don't see it that way. I don't. And I'm sorry. I love you all. And I hope you can hear me that I really, really love you. But I'm really worried for those that are so offended. And when they're offended, they're pulling others down into offense with them. You know, the Lord says, touch not my anointed. And he says what will happen to those that tear down a little one in the face. If in our offense... We're gathering those around us at times and making them offended because we're offended. Then a woe's coming upon those that are doing that. And you need to repent and you need to repent right away. As do we all. We all do. So, um, Oki or whoever is in there, could you put... That's all I'm going to say about that right now. The Holy Spirit quits. I quit. <laughs> I 
I'm sorry. When I have no more words, I have no more words. I can move on. Um, Romans, I want to get into Romans 8 real quick. Because as soon as you start talking about sin, those that do not understand the fullness of the word will point this out. And so I'm talking to the ministers right now. These are the ministers who are not in offense. I want us to see something in the scripture. Because sometimes when you are ministering to someone, they will say, well, I can get drunk. You're just condemning me. You're judgmental. I'm talking to the ministers right now. If someone could put Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Thank you, Oki. I want you guys to look at this with me. Read this with your spiritual eyes. There is no condemnation in Christ. There is no, well, therefore, there is, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in the Messiah, Yahushua. Is there a period there? Because I don't see one. Do you see a period there? No. Now let's read it in fullness. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in the Messiah. Oops, I was reading on the screen. I get my Bible. <clears throat> okay, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no period there. There's no condemnation who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Right? So what happens to those who do not walk in the spirit and walk in the flesh? They're condemned. They have no covenant with Jesus. There's no covenant. We have got to rightly divide the word people. We need to be ready in season and out of season to teach, right? Do you guys see this? Every time we start calling evil evil and good good, the religious ones come in who are now in sin and still in sin, not under covenant with Jesus, and say there is no condemnation in Christ. They leave out particular areas of the scripture because of the doctrines of men. But what it says is that there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but are walking in the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, and there is the covenant. Amen. The number one mistake... There's probably two listeners left left now. Bless your hearts. Oh, my word. The number one mistake Israel made is formulating covenants with various things outside of their covenant with God. We're no different. Today, the Lord is calling us to take an honest look at our personal lives. What covenants have we made that are impeding our covenant with him? Because our first and foremost stance should be him. Without waiver, without compromise. We're to have no other gods before him. Amen. Some of us need to let him in 
and block others from entering into that secret place, into that castle. Amen? We need to let him in. And we need to cast some out. Just into the secret place. Nothing, nothing should take preeminence over him. Sometimes these messages are hard to deliver. When we were in that second Corinthians and we were talking about being unequally yoked, He doesn't want us to cast others away. He wants to cast us to cast idols away that are on our hearts, in our hearts. So how would we carry this out in a meaning, meaningful way? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to Strive to grow our personal vertical relationship with the Lord. And I used to talk about this a lot. I guess he hadn't laid this on my heart in a while. But once we get that vertical relationship spot on 100% between us and the Lord, right? and secure and balanced, then all the horizontal relationships will also grow in Christ. But we have to place him above all things in our lives. So the measure of unity and success that we have as a ministry as a gathering of like-minded believers is based directly in proportion to how willing each person is to die to self so Jesus reigns within. You get what I'm saying? How successful we are in unity and in the ministry. It's a direct proportion to how willing each individual person is to die to self. So when a people gather together, are honest and are in truth and lead and express Christ's life that's covenant-based, then te- togetherness occurs and the reflection of the love of Jesus is imminent. And how will they know him? By our love. But it's a truth love. It's not a vain love. It's not a flesh love. It's not a love of self. It's not even a love of them, their self, their flesh. Are we trying to grow the flesh of someone or the spirit of someone? What comes into covenant with the Lord? Is it someone's flesh or is it their spirit? Remember I said that the soul is subjective, has to come under subjection to Christ? Are we trying to grow each other's flesh here? Because I don't want mine grown. I despise my flesh. If I don't want my flesh grown, why would I try to grow someone else's flesh? Why would I do that? I would do that out of self. Because the flesh does not reflect the covenant of the Lord. I don't need people to be in covenant with me. I need them to be in covenant with the Lord with me. Does this make sense? Go get in covenant with the Lord and then we'll talk about it. I get all these people wanting to help us in the ministry. I want them to help. I want them to serve. But could you please serve Jesus first? 
If you're not serving Jesus, then you can't serve him with me. Because you'll bring the whole ministry down. Go serve him. Go get in covenant with him. Go serve the Father first. And then, and then go serve others. The church is broken because we're trying to serve other people and grow up their flesh when we should be serving the Father. So no flesh is grown. And that's why a woe is coming and he's going to purge his church. If the real bride of Christ would stand up, then we may not even have to be purged with such intensity. But the chances of that happening are slim to none, evidently, because we've got ministers out there that all they care about is growing a congregation, which is flesh. And I'm, forgive me, but I'm, I'm just very distraught over this. It's grieving my spirit because Jesus is not enough. Because if Jesus is, is enough, then we wouldn't be in the state that we're in. Help us, Lord. We need to be gathered together in truth and in honesty. We must learn as we mature to be careful what we enter into co covenant with. The body of Christ should not be entering into anyone that is in the flesh. Because in this covenant, this new covenant, there is no flesh involved. So now that we know exactly what a covenant is, we've talked a little bit about what it isn't. It's not a modern day contract of self gain. It's not easily broken. The covenant of the Father is never, ever broken. He doesn't establish a covenant and then he starts taking it away. We may walk away from it, but he doesn't change. So, as a leader, as a minister, that's you all are called to love all. But that does not mean that we enter into a covenant with the whole world. Are you called to preach to the whole world the gospel of Christ? Amen. Yes, you are. We're called to make disciples of all men. But then we're not called to look like them, to look like the world. Jesus loved, he taught, he delivered all the masses who were seeking him. And yet he had a set apart group of disciples that he called friends because they knew him intimately. Jesus knew the masses of the people, yet the masses did not know him. If they would have known him, they wouldn't have put him up to die for death. Jesus knew all. Jesus loved all. Yet not all knew him. Only the disciples loved him. You are to love all the masses. But they don't all love you. They don't all know you. So stop sleeping with someone that doesn't know you. That doesn't love you. Get out of that unholy covenant. Amen? Many of us are allowing open doors by walking in covenant with someone when our calling is actually to minister to them. Like I said, we love all, but who we let down the guard of our hearts to has caused much unnecessary conflict and pain. To some, God calls us to receive from. To others, he calls us to pour out into them, and in some cases, it is both. But it is not all in all. Our inner circle, our castle, as Michael calls it, calls it is who you are intimate with, is something we need to understand and understand biblically. 
we should love and we should feed those that the Bible defines as maybe swine is an example because we're not to cast our pearls to them. And when we do, they'll use it against us and shred us to pieces. That would be the picture of being unequally yoked. But do we love them? Heaven, yes, we love them. That's why we're here. It is why we are here. I mean, I wouldn't even need to be here if I didn't. And you wouldn't either. You would not stay in even those situations that are dysfunctional if you didn't love people. Duh. Would we get a beaten from people if we didn't love them? No. But he says, come out of her, my people, so you do not partake in her sins, because he wants us taking that covenant and showing them what it looks like, not being in the flesh anymore. Hmm. Okay, I love this. So I'm going to bring Pastor Bubby on, because we have 10 minutes, and he can lead us in prayer. He, he's led me before in prayer of it. He can lead us into the breaking of these unholy ties. They are soul ties. Amen, Pastor Bummy. I didn't think of the soul tie thing, but that is what it is. Thank you, Lord. Pastor Bubby. Okay, I had to push a few buttons here, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, You know what? It is a given. Every Wednesday, I will be putting you on the spot at the end because I need you. <laughs> so I need you to come in and just tie everything up as a pastor when I teach like that. So thank you for being on the ready. I'm, I'm still preparing. Hang on just a second. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, uh, yes. now I can hear you. I had to uh, switch headphones and stuff, but ab- I'm sorry. Ab- and no, it's okay. Absolutely. Um, we need to understand that when we open ourselves up to these relationships that we uh, also open ourselves up to unholy soul ties. Amen. And we can be free of these. It it can become a burden. We can take on uh, an insurmountable weight by, by doing that, by heaping one upon another and upon another. And so what we need to do is we need to break that curse and we need to stop it in the name of Jesus Christ. And how we do that is by speaking the Lord's word over it. You see, he became a curse for us on the cross. He is the only sacrifice that we need. We need not have another blood sacrifice. So when, whenever I encounter this, I just simply ask people to repeat after me. This Heavenly Father, please forgive me for all relationships that are not of you. Lord, I, I break all unholy soul ties. I give back to them what they have given me, and I take back from them what I have given them. I stop these relationships. I cut these relationships off in the name of Jesus Christ, and I seal them with the blood of the Lamb, Jesus All these doors and windows I close now in the name of Jesus Christ and by the blood of the Lamb. I ask you, Father, to guide me in all my relationships, to set before me those divine appointments and to help me fulfill them. In the name of Jesus, Son of the living God, I pray. Amen. It's that simple. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bubby. Hey, um, because I know I asked you this probably a year or two ago, maybe just while we have time, and I'm going to mute myself and let you talk a little bit, but um, just as a child, maybe what would that look like to someone that, you know, they really love the person and they don't want to be entangled in the sin of the soul tie, but yet they don't want to just turn their back on someone. And so what does that look like in the healthy nature of Jesus? Do you mind to share a little bit about that? Well, I think for me, we, we have to be honest with the person and, and say, look, I have a problem with our relationship and this is why. 
we whenever we have anything against our brother we need to go to them in love and say you know please don't be offended at what I'm about to say because I want to say it in all love and in truth and it, without pointing a finger ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in that conversation and he will it's a difficult thing there's nothing easy about it but sometimes we just have to part ways with those that we love we don't have to quit praying for them ever and I'd say do, do not give up on anyone as long as they have breath in their body I believe that they are redeemable that's my personal belief so I won't give up on anyone although I cannot continue to minister to some or to to fellowship with others and sometimes God will not let me continue that relationship because he is doing a work within them it's nothing of me and all of him and I need to step out of the way and let God's will be done sometimes we want to we want to fix things you know we want to get in there and help and help and you know see the people grow and be healed and delivered but sometimes We've got to let spirit deal with spirit and just stay out of the way, but stay in prayer and supplication and uh, petition before the Lord for them. Amen. And you know, that when I stepped out of the way on several occasions, that's when I saw him really do a mighty work. Amen. It was almost like I became a stumbling block. You know, you've heard of those codependent relationships. You, someone can drain the life out of you and then your covenant is compromised with the Lord and you've gotten this entangled in this and then they're looking to you to be their savior. That's right. And as long as you're... And I had to repent. Yeah, as long as you're there for them every time they have a problem, um, they're never going to grow. You have to point them to Jesus every time and say, look, you're not going to have me forever. I'm going to be here for a short time and then I'm going to go poof. But, Je oh, I but know. Jesus, you're always going to have. He's never going to let you down. I'm going to disappoint you, you know, no matter what. Oh, no matter yes, what. and I do. Oh, and I do. Boy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but he won't. No, and, he won't. you know, and then when you disappoint them, then they get upset and they lash out at you. Well, like I gave, you know, my testimony that I went through recently. But the Lord doesn't want us in that anymore. And that's just the plea of my heart. That is even why I even spoke today. And that's part of, because, part of that, not taking offense, too. Mm -hmm. you know, so we, we yeah. have that choice. We can choose to take offense, to get angry, to get bitter, to carry that around with us. Or we can choose, no matter what happens or what is said or done to us, knowing that Christ said we would be persecuted for his namesake. We can say, thank you, Lord Jesus, and move on, keeping them in prayer and petition, and yet distancing That's ourselves wonderful. from that unholy tie. Yeah, yeah. And this is not turning our back on another. No, it's allowing and, um, the Lord to work. Get out the way. Get up or get out the way. That's one of my favorite <laughs> songs. <so. laughs> you play that this afternoon. <laughs> but, yeah, and so we just... You know, Pastor Bubby and I, we just collectively, you know, we come together and pray that the Lord seal these truths up, these seeds that we have placed before you and within you today. And, you know, we just ask the Lord that he would continue to show him or show you a greater measure of him and what it looks like to be in the perfect covenant with the one that is perfect. And that is our Father in heaven. And um, I just ask that he would watch over you, that he would continue to guide and direct you, and that it's all about this intimate relationship with him, you and him, first and foremost. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, God bless you all. And thank you, Pastor Bubby, for today, God, for making today happen. God bless you, Sissy, and thank you for delivering the Lord's word. Amen. That needed to be Amen. said, and we've all walked it, I'm sure, most recently. Uh, my hand's going up in the air right now. So. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I hope it. 
I hope it helps someone and I hope I just want him to get all the glory for it. So I love you, Pastor Bubby. I love each of one, one of you that are listening to me today and even those that aren't. And um, God bless you. Michael should be on this evening and chances are he'll pick right up where we left off today. All right. Join, join <laughs> us for praise and worship and don't forget ta- yes. Tatum tomorrow morning. Oh, yes. I can't wait for that tomorrow morning. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Honey. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.